Well, thanks very much, Sarah, and the Myosh team. Appreciate very much being able to have this opportunity to speak to, to your audience. So um, we'll pick up pretty much where we left off, off last week. Last week, we talked about, uh, we kind of provided an introduction to, to HOP, to human and organizational performance, and talked through the kind of five principles uh, and some of the terminology around, around HOP. So that, that's kind of like, I guess, more of the, the theory. What does this look like in practice? So that's a, we're going to kind of dive in a little bit into that uh, today and hopefully give you a feel for what do these principles look like in action. So just a quick refresher from last week, the five hot principles that we talked about, people make mistakes. We know this, we've known this for a long time. We all intuitively know this. Uh, even on our best day, we are going to make mistakes because we're human, we're fallible. Um, and we have to acknowledge the fact that we can't change the human condition, but we can change the conditions in which people work, uh, as James Reason said a long time ago. So that's our first principle, people make mistakes. Secondly, acknowledging that blame fixes nothing. Now, we're not going to go into the whys and wherefores of whether there should be blame when there's times to have blame. But the principle on its face is it doesn't fix anything, it doesn't make anything any better. Uh, and at the same time, there's a whole lot of baggage that comes along with blame that blocks learning and makes uh, progress in many different ways harder. It damages trust, it damages engagement, uh, blocks the flow of information, makes learning harder. So there's lots of kind of lots of flow on effects of blame which are not very useful uh, and we don't really get much upside from it. Third, context drives behavior. Um, so this is the acknowledgement that, yeah, people make mistakes. Uh, and sometimes uh, that results in consequences, maybe sometimes bad consequences, really quite bad consequences. But we're not as interested in just focusing on the actions or inactions of the people involved as trying to understand the context they were operating in and why it made sense for people to do the things they did. People generally, in a work setting, they do things that make sense to them. If it didn't make sense, they probably wouldn't have done it at the time. Um, so that's what we're more interested in understanding, the conditions and the context around work um, to make sense of things. Fourth principle, learning is vital. And we're going to focus on that principle, particularly uh, today in putting the application into place. We talk about the concept of the black line and the blue line, which we'll look at in a moment. And then finally, response matters. The way we respond to when things go wrong is critical but not just when things go wrong. Our response in general um, is very important. How we respond to good news stories, bad news stories, how we respond when we see things that we didn't, don't expect to see. So it's just worth reflecting for a moment as well on these principles, because the question was asked last week, and I've seen this come up a number of times. Okay, hot principles are great for investigations. I see where all those five of those principles fit in, but is it just about investigation? Uh, and what I say is no, definitely not. HOP is really important and useful for both looking backwards and looking forwards. So it mentions here, looking backwards to understand and learn. So when things go wrong, the HOP principles can be really obviously very useful and, and guide us to try and understand why that thing went wrong. If you think about it, people, people make mistakes, we know blaming people isn't going to be useful, so we want to put aside the blame. We want to try and learn. And if we manage our response and uh, do an appropriate response, we can really learn about the context. So those five principles really work well together in a looking back to try and make sense of things, even when things are like, on the face of it, seem really obvious. Why did that person put their hand in that non-isolated piece of equipment? It's one of our cardinal rules. For goodness sake, why would anyone do that? Doesn't make sense to me. And I don't understand why it makes sense to that person. Well, if we want to make sense of that and understand that, well, using those five principles um, is a good way of um, making sense of that. Uh, it gives us a lot of different direction around how to do that well. But that's only one part of it. HOP isn't just about investigating and learning from things that have gone wrong in the past as important or maybe even more importantly we use hot, the hot principles in a way of looking forward to help us understand the present state and also to take action going forward 
think about almost any action we take in safety, whether it's planning and organizing, risk management and risk assessments and things like that, work design, process design, procedure design, work environment, and even the kind of macro level, the organizational culture we're trying to develop. The HOP principles are very informative and can guide our actions in terms of what we want wanting to do going forward. Like take the first principle, people make mistakes. Well, how is that gonna therefore inform our actions, our thinking, first of all, and then our actions around planning, around risk assessments, around the way we design the use of maybe tooling or interactions, plant equipment, whatever. If we are planning on the fact that our people are perfect and they're gonna operate 100% and be compliant 100%, well, we know we're kind of overlooking this fundamental principle. People make mistakes. Even the best people, the best trained people, they're not gonna be operating at 100% at any given time. And there is this other kind of world out there and these other influencing factors that operate around us at all times, which we have to try and consider. So the principles are as important looking forward as they are as in terms of looking back to, to understand. Now, the first question people often ask is, okay, where do I start with HOP? Okay, I'm, I like the ideas, I like all this new view stuff. Uh, and of course, as we mentioned last week, the five principles, that's just the overarching framework. There's a lot of other stuff and ideas and concepts that sit underneath those five principles. But the five principles are our, they're the entry point to start a conversation. But where do I start? What does this look like in practice? Well, we've got lots of information we can share with you. We're trying to share just a little bit today to explain what and demonstrate what some of this looks like when it's put to action. So it's worth talking about the kind of loose framework that we generally all work to when we're trying to start hop happening in an organization. Um, now, there is no one right way of essentially implementing hop. There is, uh, it's gonna look different in every organization, every operational setting and context and group of people is different. So there's gonna be variability it's almost inherent within the philosophy, that fact. But this kind of loose framework is more or less going to be common. So first up, in any organization, when you're trying to seek to change something fundamental, like its belief system, the way it views and does safety, uh, that's going to be a, potentially quite a long slog. So first of all, the first phase we talk about generally is this, having to try and garner interest and commitment. Find those kind of, uh, it might be an area, it might be a plant, it might be a location, it might be a a leader, a senior leader who kind of either likes it or gets it. Um, and it's working in that area and building that interest and getting that commitment to initially try something. Now, we'll talk in a minute about how different organizations have gone about doing this. Some have done the kind of like, well, we've got budget, we've got approval, let's just go, we're going to roll this out everywhere. That can work, but I don't, I'm generally quite skeptical of that approach. Um, what we're trying to do is build start from a bottom up and build up where we can as opposed to having like a centralized rolled out type program one of the things you may remember we talked about last week hop is not a program so we maybe sometimes have to work a little bit differently but that's the first thing we're looking to try and gain that initial interest and commitment in my experience this isn't that hard to do getting the whole organization aligned that can be hard but finding that initial place to start to get some initial interest Talk about these principles, these ideas that some organizations do, they start to socialize some new view ideas. And you'll very quickly find people who are interested and maybe willing to uh, advocate for those ideas and willing to try something different. Your organization may be in a place where you've been doing the same thing for a long time and results aren't changing. Well, we know that kind of doing the same thing over and over and maybe doing it harder isn't going to improve results. So maybe you're recognizing that in your organization already. Maybe there is an appetite. Some oftentimes when we start working with organizations, it's because there is an appetite. They don't know what that is they want to move to, but they know they want it, they're ready for a change. And the second phase is then about building that foundational understanding of what, the five principles and the kind of ideas and concepts that sit underneath that. Now, this again isn't just a once-off event. This isn't the case of right, okay, we come in, do a bit of a briefing, have some chats, socialize some of the ideas, we do some formal training, done, tick that box, we can move on. This is an ongoing process uh, and it takes constant effort. It takes kind of inter in, in your organization, coaching each other as managers around 
because um, it's very easy to fall back into old habits. Talking about these ideas, we look great, we love it, this is where we want to go, we're very uh, hot on these kind of new ideas, new views, psychological safety, uh, setting people up for success and all these kinds of things. But as soon as something goes wrong, it's very easy just to fall back on old habits. So it takes a long time to change the kind of the, those kind of cognitive biases and heuristics and the way we our, our kind of go-to reactions when, when dealing with certain situations. So that's an ongoing thing that takes, uh, I guess, training, exposure, discussion, socializing the ideas, and over time, things change. But following hot on the heels of developing that understanding of hot is the third element. And this is where we really start to see this is going beyond the thinking about things differently to doing things differently. Uh, and that's beginning what we call operational learning. And we're going to talk about that in probably in the most length today in, in today's webinar. Uh, and fourth, and this is like in, informed by steps two and three, uh, is then building more for an organizational alignment around the kind of these five principles and the ideas and concepts that go along with it. What you'll find is over time, as organizations start to introduce new things, which are focused on operational learning, developing, um, or it might be blue line stories, doing learning teams. We start to find on the one hand, we're doing all these great new things. We're getting all this information and intel we've never had before. We're getting this understanding uh, and doing this great learning and, and locally owned solutions. And we start to find this is no longer jiving with maybe some of the things we have in our more formal elements of our systems and policies and processes and we need to start building greater alignment and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well uh, in this webinar so primarily phases three and four is what we're, we're going to be talking about today because that's where a lot of the action is happening uh, in the organization so when starting out don't think oh, my, my organization this is never going to happen because i've got no approval i've got no budget well here we've got this kind of like four way grid. So these are just some organizations that have been working with HOP and the new view ideas. And as you can see, there's like, you've got this kind of quadrant, which is yes, they've got budget, yes, they've got approval, but you've got a the quadrant there with yes, they've got approval, but no, they've got no budget. And then you've got one down there in the bottom right, no budget, no approval. Well, whichever quadrant you sit in, there are things that you can do. So I'll start with the no, no. So Cathay Pacific. Um, they didn't have a formal approval to do any new view stuff and they didn't have any budget. So they worked accordingly. And um, how they started was through kind of, I guess, informal channels through introducing, um, introducing some of the language and ideas and concepts into the tools they already had into the kind of approaches they were already using and subtly start of introducing and challenging things in a way in which people start to get curious. Hang on a minute, you're starting to use this kind of term a lot. I've been hearing people talking about goal conflicts and uh, local rationality and work is imagined versus work is done. Tell me more about all of this. And it starts to create this kind of pull, this desire for more information and things to learn. So that's one place that you can start out. Um, Mitchell Services, Josh Bryant, I think he's probably done some stuff with uh, Myosh in the past, the Myosh client. Mitchell's have done some great work. Josh has done loads of great work. Check out the Hot Lab, which I'll reference at the end of this. There's a couple of stories on there shared from both Josh and some of his team talking about the, the uh, work that they've done and the, kind of some of the transformational effects that's had in their organization. So yeah, board approval. If you think this is the way to go, Josh, you go ahead and do it, but there's no budget to do it. Well, that's not the barrier. There are other ways to achieve things. So check that out um, on the hot lab and I'll put the link to that at the end of the webinar. And then over on the other side, we've got Urban Utilities, Kim Bancroft and her team, some great work in there. Chevron, CHEP, these are organizations that uh, we've either worked with a lot or done some incidental work with and seen the kind of the work they've done. So obviously that's an envious, enviable position to be in, to have both the approval and the budget to go ahead and make this change. But you don't necessarily have to have those things to begin with. What thing was worth touching on the chat, they didn't start with a, okay, we want to do this and we're going to do it globally. They said, we want to try some of these ideas out and see how it works. And the thing that they did, which I think is really very mature and worked really well, was they did a pilot. Southpac, can you work with us in Queensland and start there? 
we're going to try a rollout, see how this works. We're going to try do the training. We're going to start doing some learning teams. Let's see how it works. Yeah, this worked well. Let's roll it out to Australia, New Zealand. And then eventually this has become a global thing for, for CHEP. So again, some good stories about those shared on the Hot Lab uh, and the Southpac International website. There'll be links to that at the end. Um, so doesn't matter where you're starting from. There are, even if you have to do it ninja style as, as Cafe have to, uh, had to start and plenty of other organizations have to start in that way too. Make a start. There's, there's always some way you can start. So the, five, the third variable, which is probably, there's probably more variables than that, but we've got budget and approval are two. The third is commitment. So I would say that's as important, if maybe as not more important than the approval and the, and the budget. If people pay lip service, well, you're, that's going to be very difficult. <laughs> you'll have people who really want to try and change and do things differently. Okay, so moving into that second, uh, sorry, third phase. As I mentioned, the third phase of, of kind of doing hop is that kind of really starting the operational learning piece. And that's probably the most significant change uh, one of the most significant changes from maybe more traditional safety, which you could argue is around, we talked about last week, centralized control, compliance management, ensuring that people are following the rules and doing the right things. And the management systems are there to make sure all that happens. We've got great systems and people just need to follow, do as they're told and everything will go well. Well, so that's, that's one way of viewing the world. But the reality is we know that there is this blue line work has done, which will almost always vary from work as imagined or work as intended. Um, so when we have accidents and incidents or near misses or whatever, that's when we most often go out and look at the work and we very easily identify this gap between the black line and the blue line. Oh, there's a gap here. They weren't compliant. They only followed the procedure and so on and so forth. And like, oftentimes we label this as a cause. This is the reason why this particular accident happened. Uh, we'll put that aside for now. We know that's not the case. We know the world is not as simple as that. The simple link, direct cause and effect relationships in, in complex socio-technical systems that our organizations are. Um, but the thing we can, say, we can learn from this as well, this blue line is present all the time. We don't have to wait for things to go wrong to learn about the blue line, to get those blue line stories, what's really happening in the organization. But more importantly, not what's, what's happening, but why is it happening that way? That kind of systems thinking conversation we talked about with the principle, context drives behavior. What are the subtle incentives, conditions, context, which is making this behavior, shaping this and influencing this behavior? So we want to understand that. I mentioned here, workers are masters of the complex um, adaptive behavior, masters of the blue line. We need to go and learn. That's in our fourth principle. Learning about everyday normal work and interactions of our people with their organizations, understand? Why do things happen the way they do? And that's that, the whole purpose of, our, of that third principle, operational learning. And there's lots of ways of doing this. I want to talk about learning teams in a minute. Learning teams are a way, they are not the only way. But I really like this quote from uh, a client we did some work with some years back, mentioned here. The key to safety will be to ask the groundsmen, the blokes that actually do the work, what they think is the best and the easiest way of doing work. That would eliminate so many injuries. Now, this is the percep perception of a, um, or obviously a frontline worker in the oil and gas industry. And I've spoken to people in lots of different industries who would have a similar sort of perspective. So many things we get asked to do just don't make any sense. They make it harder for us to get the job done. Well, wouldn't it be great to go and learn about what those things are and where those places are in our organization so we can do something about it and do something about it in advance rather than waiting for things to go wrong. And that really is the beauty of operational learning. It's not really even just about safety. This is a conversation around work. How do we make work better? How do we understand where the real difficulties and constraints and awkward conditions are, where the real risk is, as opposed to maybe the perception we have uh, if we only look at these things from a from through paperwork and through reportable incidents, whatever we do back in the office. So my question for you, and this is a rhetorical question, how well does your organization learn from everyday work? And I keep word there is learn from everyday work. We have clients who in the past have done things, say had safety interventions which are focused on everyday work. We can say even audits or work observations are focused on everyday work, but do they learn from everyday work or are they more there to focus on the everyday work and enforce compliance? 
ah, notice this worker was doing X, they should have been doing Y. Well, that's not really learning in so much that's more telling what should be happening and why that's, that's wrong. So in our experience, there's not many organizations we've worked with when we've gone in where they've already been good at learning about everyday work. They may have the opportunities to do it, but they have the activities that are focused on everyday work, but the kind of the flow of information is going oftentimes the wrong way. So what we want to get a lot better at with this operational learning discussion. We talked last week about safety one and safety two and Hall Nagel's perspective there, which is really very valuable. This move from not just learning from things that go wrong, that's the safety one kind of focus over here, like small, very small percentage of things that go wrong, but rather learning about everyday work. The vast majority of things go well. And that blue line, this variability and adaptability of our workforce, in the vast majority of cases, that adaptability and variability drives success, not failure. So let's go and learn about that variability and adaptability. We say sometimes people are the solution, not the problem. Well, let's go and try and understand what the problems are and why are people are having to be the solution. So we've talked about two areas we want to focus on. What are the capacity, the tools, resources, strategies that are present that are contributing to success every day? They may be some of the things we already know about. They may be things completely different we have no idea about. But we won't know unless we go out and find out and ask those questions. The other thing we want to do, this is not by no means an exhaustive list, but this is two key areas, and obviously conditions and constraints. What are the things that make work difficult? Oftentimes, the things that make work difficult are also the things that contribute to accidents and incidents. So how do we work with you to make this better? How do we work with you to make it easier to get work right rather than avoiding things going wrong? So that's our focus. How, if we want to understand the work, we want to get better at understanding the work and getting those blue line stories, therefore the same ultimately we want, we want better answers, we have to ask better questions. Questions that are not focused on maybe getting the answers we want or are questions that are focused on compliance, rather focus, uh, questions that are focused on generating learning, helping us to understand the conditions of the work, what's working, what's not working, what's difficult and so forth. Now, these are just some example questions. Uh, there are a whole raft of questions we put together and it's not very difficult for you to go away and think of your own questions, generative questions, questions that generate stories or generate information. Once we ask those questions and they get answered, we're gonna come away knowing more than we knew beforehand. And that's a really important point too. So it's not just asking the questions, it's having an attitude of humility, thinking, I'm asking this question because I want to know, I want to learn, as opposed to, I already believe I know the answer, and I'm asking the question just to get that confirmation. So uh, questions like, uh, tell me about your work. How hard did it get things done around here? What does a good day look like? What that can be indicating when we ask a question like, what does a good day look like? It can help us to understand, well, what are the things, what are the capacities here that help things go well? What are the conditions which are ideal? Conversely to that, what does a bad day look like? We can learn so much about what makes work hard through asking a question like that. So these are just some examples. And the ones on the, on the left, those really context rich questions, we use them and can use them to learn about normal work, everyday work, just as easily as when we want to learn about when things go wrong. So where do we use these questions? Well, one place or a place we use them is in some people learning teams. By now, I'm sure you've probably heard of this term learning teams. In 2017, when we were on the first, we ran the first learning teams training course here. Uh, we brought Bob Evans over from the United States and you know, him, Andrea and Todd Compton, I did a lot of work with learning teams in the US. We literally could not give away learning teams training back then. No one was interested in learning teams. It was like, what, learning teams? Never heard of it. Uh, whereas now, obviously, it's getting a lot, a lot more traction. Um, so what is a learning team? Well, it mentions there's a facilitated conversation with those who know the work with an objective to learn and improve. That's the, what we're going in with. We want to know what's really going on. Uh, there are methods to learn about normal work as well as successes and events. So it's a very versatile tool. It can be used in almost any setting um, with that in mind. So, um, but the critical thing is the tool is not nearly as important as the operating philosophy. So what we always say is don't start using learning teams 
until you're at least pretty conversant and confident with the principles and the ideas that sit behind learning teams and are behind the new view. And you're confident that the information that you surface and bring forward with the learning teams are going to be well received. There's nothing worse than doing something great like a learning team, but then the information is basically challenging the organization's current belief systems and norms. And all they want to do is shut down that information. No, 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 I can't hear this. This is bad stuff. They'd rather not hear sometimes than hear what's really happening. So that's the, the purpose, of, uh, the intent behind a learning team to get those blue line stories. And we, they broadly follow this kind of this uh, flow of learning and defining and improving. This is kind of the, the broad framework that learning teams are based on. So we want to learn. So the first session we ever do in a learning team, we have a group of frontline workers in the area we want to learn about. We have a facilitator typically and a scribe. That whole first session is just trying to build this understanding, getting into the context rich information, focusing on the conditions, what makes work easy, what makes work hard, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's all about learning solutions and fixes and ideas about, oh, if only we did this and only did that. It's like, let's park all this. It's a group facilitated learning session where we're all learning and making sense of, of work. The second phase that follows then is then defining what are the actual issues here? Not the surface issues or the symptoms that maybe we already know about, but what are the actual real underlying issues? This is what learning teams are really great at doing. I'll kind of get into those more underlying problems as opposed to the, maybe the symptomatic problems we've been chasing playing whack-a-mole in the past. And then with that in mind, once we've kind of defined that as a group, this isn't being done by the facilitators, it's being done by the people who are on the learning team. The learning team does this. They come up with the learning, they come up to find them, what the real problems are. And then we work with them to come up with, okay, what are some potential solutions? How do we make this better? And as much as possible, we wanna try and push this to be locally owned and locally done. People, the front, one of the first reservations people have when we speak to leaders, senior leaders, about learning teams, they'll say, oh, we're going to ask for stuff we can't afford. It's going to be gold plated. It's going to be this big. It's going to, and so on. So I'll say, well, just try it out. You'd be surprised. Sometimes the solution costs $10 and it just requires some local kind of authority or autonomy to be given to say, yes, make this happen. And the incredible thing that happens with that is people feel that ownership and commitment then. People, have ownership and commitment around things they've helped create way more than something which is pushed down from, from the top. So this kind of learning, defining and improving framework is the most important part of um, what makes a learning team. And that learning phase has got to be a completely safe environment. We just got to be assured there'll be no comebacks on people when they share the information, the blue line stories they're going to share. So who's there, who's there in this learning team? Well, typically we have to have a sponsor who's involved, then typically not in the learning team. That might be a senior leader, a plant manager, a general manager, whoever it might be in your organization and your hierarchy. And that sponsor is a person who says, yes, I'm interested, I'm committed. I wanna know what's going on. I'm not gonna be in there because no one's gonna talk and tell me all this stuff while I'm sat there, but I'll maybe come in at the front, tell people this exercise has got my full backing and support. And I wanna hear about what you come up with at the end and then that's it you have a scribe who's making notes openly transparently ideally on a whiteboard or on um, you know giant you know jumbo sticky pads whatever they're called you're making the notes everyone can see it we're not taking uh transcriptions of so and so said this and bob said that and jane said this it's about getting the learnings and that was all coming from those blue line workers the people who do the work every day so they're the people involved the process itself, I'm not gonna to focus too much on the process. We've actually got a guide we've put together, which is you're able to download the last slide of this webinar. We'll actually have a link there. So you can go to our web, uh, website and you can download a guide on learning teams if, you're, if you so desire. So that'll be up there at the end of the, of the webinar. But this is the kind of the 10 steps that we've kind of, we work with on, on learning teams. We tried in the, at the beginning when we first started doing learning teams, not to try and make this too much of a process but what we found is by keeping it too loose people struggle to really latch onto the ideas and, and put them into action so we found having some framework uh, helps so the whole thing is based on that concept of learning defining and improving and then within that we've got these like 10 steps so 
pre-learning team figuring out what it is we're going to intend to go out and try and learn about. So there's got to be some kind of need. Uh, so that could be uh, one way of doing a bit of work at the moment is like, well, looking at can we use learning teams to verify critical controls? A lot of focus on critical controls and critical risk management at the moment. Well, let's do a learning team around understanding are the critical controls we believe in place, are they really in place? Let's do a learning team with the people who are responsible for working around these controls every day. It could be about a particular a known trouble spot or an already a known problem. There's no particular, there's no accident or incident, but it's, an, it's a problem area, whatever it might be. It could be a, a recurring behavioral, behavioral issue you are having in the organization. Maybe do a learning team on that. Figure out what some of the more underlying issues are. So we have to determine that need, involve the key sponsor who's going to provide top cover for us, and then prepare to deliver that learning team. The actual learning team itself involves, okay, getting this group of workers together. It can be workers from any part of the organization, depending on what the um, what the focus is of that learning team. And run that. Firstly, an introduction. Hey, this is a safe space. We're interested in getting these blue line stories. You might talk about the five principles. Um, and then that whole first session focus on just on learning. And you're meant to do more than one session just on learning. Uh, maybe a complex problem you have several sessions just on learning and building out the context and really understanding the, the deep messy stories um, and after that we allow for some soak time ideally this is overnight it doesn't have to be overnight but it's preferable we all know what happens when we go away and, and sleep um, all types of things interesting things happen to that information which is assimilated new ideas come forward and in that second session that's when we do that defining Figuring out, okay, what do we believe the real underlying issues are? Let's come up with the with either the, the key themes or the problem statements that we want to work on. And once we have those, the actual problems, then we can start exploring a different set of solutions. And ideally, we're not looking for just one. Like, oh, this is the problem, this is the fix. The learning team generally waste works to try and surface as many different possible options that we can explore. And then not say that's the fix, let's roll it out, it's done. Let's try it. Let's see what works. Let's see if it, that was successful. That wasn't so successful. And it's really quite uh, it's an agile in its approach. Um, it's not, this is it now, it's done. Um, so we we run that second session, get some solutions, and then that kind of wrap up and then going into the post-learning team is about then actually putting the stuff into action. That's the, probably the where the rubber really hits the road where it's critical to get some quick wins. That's another reason why we often say. When you're doing this learning team, as much as possible, try and see where they can get some local ownership and some local actions that can be done very quickly. Because we've all had initiatives where it gets people excited, people get involved, and then nothing happens, nothing changes. And it's for that reason we also say, don't do too many learning teams to begin with, or even maybe ever. Focus them, use them, and but they surface a lot of information and they all surface a lot of ideas. So you don't want to be overwhelmed with too much. So that's the kind of process. And like I say, you can download the guide from our website. We'll share that link with you at the end. What's really incredible about the learning teams is the outcomes we see. And these are both tangible and intangible. So the tangible outcomes, well, that's the learning and the insight that we come away with. Wow, we know all this stuff now we didn't know beforehand. And that allows us to put better corrective actions and improvements in place. Uh, it also enables us to make better decisions and be better informed going forward. So that they're, they're great tangible outcomes. The intangibles are really hard to kind of measure. Maybe you don't even want to measure them, but they're really valuable. It's the sharing of stories that goes on afterwards, the grapevine type stuff. I doubt any of you have ever been asked in your professional careers in safety, hey, I want to be audited or I want to be investigated. Can you make sure I'm on that next investigation you run? Generally doesn't happen. People want to be involved in learning teams. Hey, I've seen the stuff that's happened on this learning team is great. I would love to be involved in the learning team that involves bettering and improving the work people involved in. The vast majority of people, they want, they're committed. They want to make improvements to the workplaces they work in. So this is an amazing way of doing that. It changes the narrative over time. Changing the narrative and the stories that are shared is a way of changing the culture over time. I know we talk a lot about changing culture. Well, I'm not sure how you change culture, but I know this certainly helps long-term. Doesn't happen overnight, but it can change over time. 
And the thing that critically this builds, again, over time is engagement and trust. And there's any organization say, oh, we don't need any more engagement and trust. I think we're all in the business of trying to build engagement and trust in safety uh, and generally. So this is one way of helping to build that engagement and trust between, which goes both ways. I think this kind of statement really sums up quite nicely what I think is so great about learning teams. Uh, Todd Conklin says, the op operational wisdom is the difference between fixing the right things the first time or fixing the wrong things aggressively and often, which really is the, what we equate to like safety whack-a-mole, where you feel like you're forever afterwards chasing the, chasing the mole as it's popping up, but oftentimes where we're just fixing or chasing symptoms rather than dealing with underlying issues. And that's where learning team can really add that real value in helping us to deal with the real underlying issues. So, as I said, there are new methods an approach for learning about from accidents, incidents, but also really critically from normal work. The critical the one rider would say is the tool is great, but it's not nearly as important as the operating philosophy. So always try and try and bear that in mind. So there's one new idea, learning teams, a relatively new idea. Now for a not so new idea. We have lots of tools in our tool chest as safety people already work observations, inspections, pre and post job activities, potentially audits, site visits, senior leadership site visits, uh, risk assessments, committees and meetings. Our question is, how can you build operational learning into those existing practices? And there's lots of interesting ways that, that has been done in some of the organizations that either we've worked with or ones we know of. So really interesting question I feel to ask, which is, uh, Tell me about work, something which is dumb, dangerous, or different. So I've heard that also asked as, what is the dumbest thing we ask you to do? It might be in safety, quality, whatever, but when you ask a question of work, what is the dumbest thing we ask you to do? It's incredible some of the things that that can surface. And that, for me, service means at a complete waste of time and time which we way better allocated to do something which is meaningful, can actually improve safety. So think about, we talked about those generative questions earlier on. Of all these activities that you're currently doing, how many of them are focused on the black line? How many of them could add a focus of asking about the blue line? And not just asking about it, but then seeking to understand. Because that's when we then really start to become informed and we can then start to make better decisions, better interventions, often that are informed by the real issues, but involved it has the involvement and commitment of the frontline workers as well. So this isn't just about doing new things. New things is obviously a place for those new things, things like learning teams, but traditional tools and reapplying them where you can, bring in some of this kind of um, operational learning into those activities. Okay, that was the third phase, operational learning. The fourth phase, organizational alignment. Now this is a long game. This isn't going to happen overnight. It's a, and you can argue it's a continuous thing. As we continue to do more learning, we get identify more potential barriers and challenges and things that need to be better aligned to this kind of operating philosophy. So it's an ongoing thing. But if you think from, say, a management systems perspective, we've got here the kind of the key causes of 45,001. They're kind of the aspects of any management system almost any organization is going to have. Think about all of those areas. How do they, each of those areas and the things you do in those areas, how well do they align with HOP and the new view? Think about, and I said that this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but what is your leadership approach like? What is your safety leadership approach? Is it kind of aligned with the five principles? Does it see people as being a solution? Does it see adaptive capacity as the reason or a big contributor towards why we're successful? Or is it more based on people turning up and showing their face and having to make a kind of a particular stand around things which are compliance related or enforcement of particular standards? Think about the metrics, targets and objectives that we currently count, measure, publicize, reward people with. Do these align with the, the new view, with the fact that it's capacity that we're really interested in building as opposed to reducing the numbers of things going wrong, which as we know full well, 
leads to flow on effects of numbers games and potentially things being hidden and so forth. How do our HR practices align with the five principles? How does our hiring and firing look? What does our induction process look like? What does our ongoing training look like? How do we treat people when they're involved in accidents and incidents? There's a whole box of stuff that goes along with the, from the HR perspective and aligning that with the new view. Training and competence kind of alluded to that. What does our risk management look like? Are we interested in all preventative stuff? Or do we believe that not all accidents are preventable and we need to build capacity to fail safely? How about our processes and procedures? Who are they written by? Who are they written for? Sometimes you read policies and procedures and think, was this written by a lawyer for a lawyer? Or is it written by someone with the intent of it's being used in an operational setting? So the list can go on and on, but there are lots of different places we have to think, well, how well do these currently align with the new view? Some of them may be only requiring small changes and tweaks. Others of them may require a whole comprehensive change to the way you do business. But as I say, that's not something which is ever going to happen overnight. So that's kind of kind of a snapshot of what this can look like in, in action, putting this into work. So obviously there's the, first of all, garnering the interest and commitment. That's first thing, step one, um, building that foundational understanding of the hot principles and, and new view ideas, beginning operational learning, phase three, and phase four, the ongoing process of organizational alignment with those kind of principles and ideas and the operational learning that we're doing. If you're interested in knowing more about learning teams, you can download our guide, free guide for uh, learning teams. That's just go to southpackinternational.com forward slash learning dash teams. Um, and you can download that, that guide. If you are interested in knowing more about, well, where do I start? How do I get this? How do I pitch this to the key stakeholder in my organization? Connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, most people are on LinkedIn these days. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, and just say, I'm interested in the pitching guide. We put another guide together, which is a, I can get another free guide on how to pitch this to your leadership team or your relevant stakeholders. And there's some practical advice there in terms of how to put together a, a good pitch, whether it's an elevator pitch or it's going to be a formal presentation to how do we get people interested in trying something new? Because we know that's not easy. And um, we're providing that information there to help you along the way. Uh, and I mentioned also about the hot lab. Um, Go to the southpackinternational.com forward slash hot lab. There's stuff on there. There's some case studies, some of the organizations we've worked with, but also our YouTube channel, uh, the hot lab. There is loads and loads and loads of free videos on there and loads of stuff about kind of the ideas, the concepts and around the principles, but also there's a whole lot of stuff in there around practical stories shared by the people who've been doing this. Uh, it's all very well hearing it from Southpack. Oh, they do this, do that, do the next thing. But it's all the better when you hear it from people who've been doing it, putting it into action and seeing the results they've had. So some of those companies I referenced earlier, there's stories from those organizations shared by people from those organizations. So thanks very much. There's some ways to connect to us and get some of those uh, resources. Uh, happy to hand over now to uh, any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Andy. Um, I will share those links in the email later too. I was just um, frantically copying them. So we have a couple of questions. Um, the first from Michael, who says he experienced a barrier to change in particular from the financial performance measurement. In all businesses, training, improvement, meetings, et cetera, are considered non-value added expenses. I experienced people very enthusiastic to CI only to be pushed back and actually punished because of non-productive work hours. What is your view on how to deal with this? Mm, it's a, um, it's a challenging one, isn't it? Uh, it depends on the uh, on the organisation too. I've, um, I forget who I was talking to recently, and they were telling me the organisation they were working with had everything worked out to the minute blocks or eight minute blocks or something like that in terms of what that costs the business per hour. So whether it's a pre-start meeting or any training we do, they're working at the cost, that, that can be really difficult uh, because some of the benefits are intangible or long-term. Um, so I don't really have a really simple and pithy answer for you there. Um, an organization's got to have an appreciation that not all things that are valuable have a cost uh, or can be easily measured. 
So it's about looking at the uh, intangibles, but also one thing I would say is in many of the organizations we work on, the improvements they make not only have a safety impact, very often they also have very uh, real dollar value, which they the things which are uh, savings for the organization where they can see in, in either activities which are not uh, maybe required or not value adding, where there's ways of being more efficient, which is obviously adds cost savings. Um, so there is there are obviously those direct uh, effects, but I'll give some further thought to, to that because it's a, it is a difficult problem. And if I come up with anything profound, I'll get in touch with you, Michael. Okay, so um, Chris says, how do you build in the requirements for things that really go wrong and so workers may not have personal experience of, for example, trench collapse as a trench shield can make the job more difficult? Is this where freedom, quote, freedom in a frame applies? Yeah, good question. Um, it depends, is the, is the answer. Freedom in a frame means there's freedom, but it also means there's a frame. So what I would say is around critical risk, where you know for a fact that people can and have, for example, been killed in the workplace through not applying a particular control, um, that may be a place you feel that's not appropriate to have uh, a degree of autonomy. It may be, well, this is, these are really non-negotiable, and it comes down to communicating why. Um, but there may be in other places then where you will allow that discretion. I don't know your operational context, but uh, there are other places where we definitely have overly prescriptive rules and where it's, we don't need to be as prescriptive and we don't have to tell workers how to, how to do this and how to do that. We can allow that kind of latitude for them to figure that out for themselves. So there's always going to have to be an element of, we said last week, safety one, safety two, centralized control versus adaptive capacity. We have to, it's about finding that middle route where we have, we know we have to have some element of centralized control and we do have to have the framework but then it's also allowing where's the, where are the appropriate places to have adaptive capacity. So it's that kind of negotiation that you could argue between the two, as opposed to it's just one or it's just the other. Um, I hope that sort of answers the question. Um, yes, Hoven asks, what are your thoughts on capacity index and is this aligned with HOP? So without being uh, any more specific than that, I'm not really sure which capacity index you're referring to. There are a couple I'm aware of that have been developed. Um, and they're the ones I'm thinking of, yes, they would be aligned with HOP. Obviously, we talk a lot about uh, safety isn't just the absence of things going wrong. It's the presence of capacity to make things go well. There are lots of different things we can potentially consider and think of as being, being capacity and they can be capacities that exist in an individual and local level or team level, but and also organizational capacities. So anything which is helping us to try and maybe get an understanding of those capacities, yeah, that, that would certainly align with, um, with HOP for sure. Okay, well, that's all the questions for now. Um, I just want to share a link to the week, webinar next week for anyone who's not seen an email. And um, so, yeah, that's um, been fantastic again. Thank you, Andy. And um, no I will share that information later today and also those links that um, you mentioned and your colleagues shared in the chat as I'll share them in the email as well later today. So um, that's it until next week. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks uh, again for Southpac and Andy and the team for joining us. Thank you. No worries. Thanks very much. Okay, bye.